Cormac McCarthy's The Road presents a bleak vision of a post-apocalyptic world. We follow a man and his son as they traverse the desolate wasteland seeking refuge in the promise of a distant warmer climate. The father's only concern is his son's survival. Along the road the pair encounter the brutal depravity of man in an anarchic state outside of civilization. In the absence of agriculture, cannibalism is widespread. Cults hunt travelers and capture women as slaves. They also face the constant threat of armed bandits and the father keeps two bullets in their pistol for the event of their suicide. Both McCarthy's novel and its film adaptation present familiar themes of McCarthy's work. Pessimism about human nature and our ever-present natural tendency for the most brutal violence. Even the landscapes of McCarthy's work present a hopeless vision of a world headed inexorably for darkness and desolation. He walked out in the grey light and stood and he saw for a brief moment the absolute truth of the world. The cold relentless circling of the intested earth. Darkness implacable. The blind dogs of the sun in their running. The crushing black vacuum of the universe. While post-apocalyptic novels often feature a social commentary on the causes that are seen to have led to collapse, The Road is absent of any obvious references to political failures, values, or ecological catastrophe that led to the bleak setting of the story. The novel starts in a time of complete government absence, amongst a much reduced population scavenging depleted food stocks from before the collapse. Even rudimentary forms of social organisation like communes have mostly dissipated by the time of the setting of the story. What The Road presents is not a warning of dystopian forms of state control or weaponry, but a picture of humanity outside of the laws and moral influences of a social order. In the absence of social constraints, we see people resort to the cruelest forms of barbarism in order to assure their own survival. This is McCarthy's bleak picture of a state of nature. Theorising about conditions in an imagined state of nature that existed prior to this state was a popular thought experiment for Enlightenment social theorists such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. How do we justify the right of the state to limit, imprison and even kill people under its jurisdiction? For these theorists, the question could be answered by imagining how the state formed as a means of mediating conflict between people in a state of nature. McCarthy's vision is closest to Thomas Hobbes who wrote his magnum opus Leviathan during the calamity of the English Civil War. Hobbes imagined man's existence in a state of nature as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. The fear of death was rampant and it was dealing with this constant fear of death that justified sacrificing the liberty we enjoyed in the state of nature for the protection of an absolute sovereign. In the future as catastrophe, the author believes the road poses a fundamental question to the reader. What happens to human beings in the wake of a disaster that ends most life on earth? And offers the gloomy answer. When man is put under pressure, he reveals himself to be a pretty bad type. Cruel, egoistic, brutal. Is this bleak picture of humanity as destined for perpetual war of all against all in the absence of complex social arrangements accurate? In the road, even social collectives like the cannibalistic cults are merely useful arrangements in service of the individuals composing them. There is no place for mercy or care for the old and sick who cannot survive the wasteland by themselves. The vision of Hobbes and McCarthy is individualist, with the hopeful exception of the man's absolute devotion to his son's welfare. Hobbes argues that in the state of nature man will violently compete to secure the basic necessities of life and perhaps to make other material gains, and that we will fight and perhaps kill others out of fear so as to ensure our own personal safety. Knowing that anyone could be a threat to your life, the norm is preemptive violence motivated by fear. The man of the road is certainly driven by this fear. He violently strips a thief of his clothes in order to safely retrieve their possessions, and at one point in the story preemptively kills a traveller who he feared had been following them. The picture of man presented by Hobbes and McCarthy is a very bleak one. But is it true? In the book Tribe by Sebastian Junger, a very different picture of human nature is presented. Far from driving us to destructive individualism, hardship and catastrophe bring out the best of our innate capacities for loyalty and self-sacrifice. More powerful than our will for individual gain is our will to belong and cooperate with others like us. The question of societal breakdown in the face of calamity suddenly became urgent in the run-up to World War II. When the world powers were anticipating aerial bombardments deliberately calculated to cause mass hysteria in the cities. No one knew how a civilian population would react to that kind of trauma, but the Churchill government feared the worst, 
So poor was their opinion of the populace that emergency planners were reluctant to even build public bomb shelters because they worried people would move into them and simply never move out. Throughout the Blitz, as it was known, many Londoners trudged to work in the morning, trudged across town to shelters or tube stations in the evening, and then trudged back to work again when it got light. Conduct was so good in the shelters that volunteers never even had to summon the police to maintain order. If anything, the crowd policed themselves according to unwritten rules that made life bearable for complete strangers jammed shoulder to shoulder on floors that were at times awash in urine. The sociologist Emil Durkheim was the first to study the positive effects of war on mental health, finding that when European countries went to war, suicide always dropped. Psychiatric wards in Paris were strangely empty during both world wars, and that remained true even as the German army rolled into the city in 1940. When conflict erupted in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, depression and other mental health problems dropped drastically as tribal loyalties and hostilities were ignited and this was more pronounced in more violent areas. Younger also recounts events in the city of Yungay in central Chile, suffered in 1970 when it was struck by a devastating earthquake and rock slide, with 90% of the population dying instantly and 70,000 people in total being killed throughout the region, the survivors were left completely on their own in the buried city for days. Into this terrifying vacuum, a new social order quickly sprang up, concepts of individual private property temporarily submerged. Anthropologist Anthony Oliver Smith later wrote in his paper Brotherhood of Pain, the crisis also had an immediate status leveling effect on the nascent community of survivors it had created. As soon as the relief flights began delivering aid to the areas, class divisions returned and a sense of brotherhood disappeared. The modern world had arrived. As Junger explains, if there are phases that characterize the life of our early ancestors, community of sufferers and brotherhood of pain surely must come close. The mortality rate would have been much higher. The advantages of group cooperation would include far more effective hunting and defense, and groups that failed to function cooperatively must have gradually died out. Adaptive behavior tends to be reinforced hormonally, emotionally and culturally, and one can see all three types of adaptation at work in people who act on behalf of others. Humans are so strongly wired to help one another, and enjoy such enormous social benefits from doing so, that people regularly risk their lives for complete strangers. As we now know, there never was an originary state of nature where humans existed outside of a social unit. For most of our history, humans existed in close-knit tribes composed of their kin. We can suppose that outside of the incentives of complex societies is not a Hobbesian war of all against all, but a reversion to our more primal nature, as social, tribal, territorial creatures. Robert Airdrie was an anthropologist who wrote about our innate tendency toward territoriality and used our animal nature to challenge prevailing sociological assumptions about humans as blank slates molded by their social order. In the 18th century, we could not conceive of social orders prevailing in nature. Whether we took the view of Rousseau, that of original man strolling alone and at peace through the forest, or the still earlier view of Hobbes, that in primal times it was every man against every man, we conceived of the individual as the ancient reality, and society as the human invention. Yet the broadest and most indisputable conclusion must be that society, for almost all, and for always, has been nature's cradle. Social order, with its rules and regulations, its alphas and omegas, its territories and its hierarchies, its competitions and xenophobias, has been the evolutionary way. And if I am correct, then it is the individual as we know him that has been the human invention. The alienated and sociopathic individual envisioned by Hobbes is not the natural state of man we've overcome with our civilization, but a very modern Western phenomenon who's becoming more alienated, more sociopathic, and more common with each generation. Before civilization, tribalism was the way, and if an apocalyptic scenario such as that envisioned in the road were to transpire, we can assume that tribalism would persist. It is the man's love for his son that compels him to go on striving, even after his wife has committed suicide, and while his distrust prevents him from interacting with other travellers on the road, at the end of the story is a small ember of hope. When the father and the boy reach the sea the father has been looking for, it turns out to be just as cold and bleak as the rest of the wasteland they have traversed. After his father's death, 
the boy is offered refuge by another family who had been trailing him on the path. With the death of his father dies a certain attitude that as it turns out had been carrying the boy in the wrong direction the entire story, away from the potential cooperation with the trailing family. The father was a Hobbesian figure driven by the fear of death and the desperate attempt to prolong the life of himself and his son. The small glimmer of hope comes from the boy being welcomed by the family. Amidst the unspeakable barbarism of a world after civilization, hope is found in humanity's abiding capacity for self-sacrifice. If Ardry and Younger are correct, this is not a capacity created by modern society, but a reversion to something much more fundamental to who we are. The boy and his adopted family are carrying the fire. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and consider supporting my work on Subscribestar or Gumroad, where, as well as exclusive interviews and podcasts, you can join our monthly members-only book club. Thank you, and take care.